Can I just stress again how much I genuinely adore Amatsugai as a villain? I mean, first of all, Sakuragi always seems like he's having the time of his life. He has such a presence to him that you just can't look away from. And I just love going back and watching him when he was still the villain, when he was still a cryptic witch arsehole with such a smooth way of talking. He's just one of those people who can say whatever the hell he wants and gets away with it. And in real life, I would hate him. But in the fictional world, he's just my type of villain. I just love to hate him and I hate to love him. And he's such an awful human being and he plays it so well. Especially since Sakuragi himself just seems like such an adorable sweetheart. He is just incredible. And that's it. I have to stop and gush about Guy every now and then. <laughs> and Zero One has such an amazing range of villains too. You have Metsubo Jinnai, the villains who are not really villains. They were antagonists for a bit, but they're not ooh, evil, dastardly villains who want to destroy the world because being evil is fun. They're hacking victims. And then you have Amatsugai, the smooth talking arsehole that you just want to slap in his self righteous face who can easily manipulate any situation with a single speech. And then you have the Ark, who's just this huge, terrifying presence that exists in your nightmares of as a sleep paralysis demon. <laughs> All the villain archetypes I just adore. I love this series. <laughs> so however you revive Zansat's Chan and comments that his learning is name and completion. And I adore this, I did back then and I do now, I just find it so fascinating actively watching the process of machine learning. Watching Ansatz Chan learn from his experiences and adapt and become a completely different person. This change in Ansatz Chan is interesting to me because we get to witness it, as opposed to Jin later when he just shows up as a completely different person with no warning whatsoever. We see this and we witness the events that change Ansatz Chan and that is just so interesting to me. <laughs> Jin then comes telling Horabi that Ansatz Chan attacked one of their friends, and Horabi says, I see, wonderful. And Jin's reaction, I said this in episode 9, I think, but I really do think a lot of Horabi's characterization is told through Jin's reactions to him. And Jin's reaction of, eh? Eh? says a lot. Horabi not only being okay, but being pleased with violence against another humor gear is extremely bloody shocking to Jin. And I just love the idea that we're seeing Horby's change of personality, the Horby acting strange, the arc's influence over Horby through Jin's reaction. Horby is routinely not acting how Jin expects him to. Also, as a fun little tidbit, <laughs> when Horby says that Ansatz Chan has progressed more than Jin, I love that Nakagawa was genuinely upset that Jin was being insulted like that. I also love that Horby watches Jin when he's like a five year old pouting and puffing his cheeks and going fine then I won't listen to what Horabi says and goes and sulks in the corner and I love that he continues watching until it's clear Jin isn't going anywhere before continuing doing what he's doing. It's small little details like that I adore. One more thing about this scene, Sinagawa has this way of moving in early episodes that's so mechanical but naturally mechanical if that makes sense. I'm sure we've all seen Android characters moving around like Frankenstein's monster after he goes blind from the from the thing. Why does he go blind? Not important. We've all seen Android characters who are just incredibly stiff, but Sinagawa does it in such a way that it's not overplayed. It's not awkward. It's just well, naturally mechanical. Anyway, however he tells Ansatz Chan to go and assassinate Oda Shinya, and that's when the scene ends, and we finally get to the opening song, and it's been under two minutes, and you know by the time I get to the last arc of the series, this video is going to be like hours long because I cannot shut up. <laughs> Adoto is trying to convince Oda Shinya to give Enji another chance. Oda talks about how Adoto wants to use the drama to promote the company in a better light, and Adoto says that's part of it, but he also wants people to see the potential of humor gear. When I was watching this for the first time, I took this entire scene to mean that, yeah, Adoto wanted to promote the company in a better light, but it was more important to show humor gear in a better light. I wasn't thinking about how much Adoto focuses on wanting humans to utilize humor gear, so I saw this scene really positively and I liked it a lot of what Adoto was saying, but I'll get to that in a minute because it's Oda's turn first. All I want is to make a drama audiences will enjoy to their fullest, but can you really say you feel humanity in Enji's acting? And I really think this identifies a huge problem with the world of Zero One as a whole. First of all, whether or not Enji does have any sort of degree of humanity to him is irrelevant. He shouldn't have to because he is not human. Throughout this series, humans are on top and that shouldn't be the case. There's no sense of equality here and there's no sense of moving towards that. Enji is a humor gear. It should be okay that he acts like a humor gear. Why should he have to act human? 
Second of all, an argument can be made that in sci-fi or fantasy genres, human characters are needed for the audience to relate to. I personally disagree. I'm a huge fan of the Transformers franchise, and the human characters always irk me. My personal view has always been why would you create your own world and your own life forms and your own races and history and culture if you're then going to waste time focusing on humans? We have enough human based stories, but if you have a world of giant warrior cats and plant people and talking rats, I don't care about humans, I want to see this new fantastical world that only exists here and nowhere else. I also say that as someone who has never ever in my 20 odd years of living understood you have to make your main character relatable because I've never in my life actively related to and felt connected to any character ever until a horror movie. <laughs> but that's fine, we can agree to disagree. If you think human characters need to be at the forefront at all, at all times, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. But in the world of Zero One, it's not just humans. Human Gear exists too. <laughs> even if you think humans won't relate to any character Human Gear plays, even if that's true, why can't Human Gear relate to the character Human Gear plays? Because of course, Human Gear only exists to work, and I can't imagine are allowed leisurely activities like watching TV. But that's the problem. Once again, nobody is considering Human Gear. I just wish the argument had been what about Human Gear rather than yeah, but humans. Human Gear representation, damn it. <laughs> Acting is like a clash of human expressiveness. Humor gear are ultimately just machines, right? That kind of acting isn't something you can just imitate with cheap tricks. I'm saying this to the fictional Oada Shinya, not the very real actor who's playing himself, but maybe if you can't adapt to acting alongside a humor gear, maybe you're the one who's not a very good actor. Acting is where your human expressiveness shines. Well, maybe human acting is, but we're not talking about human acting because he's not human. You wouldn't tell a rock singer that they're a crap singer because singing is all about vibrato and hitting those falsettos. And then added her. It's true humor gear are machines, but they change depending on who they interact with. Put your hearts into facing them, and humor gear will respond in kind. However, continue to mistreat them, and you'll never form a and you'll never form a worthwhile relationship. I liked this. I like this a lot because that's true. Humor gear AI, they're at a disadvantage. I've said this before. I think, or I plan to say it in another video I'm working on. I can't remember. But AI don't have childhoods. We do to learn things. The lessons we learn through our experiences as kids. They're doing that now, and I like that this is putting the responsibility on humans and human interaction with humor gear. If you constantly mistreat an AI, that is what will shape them as people, and that is basically their entire experience. They are learning from you. I wish this led to them knowing where to place the blame in the future, but... <laughs> he then goes on to say that isn't much different to humans. I like that he's forcing Oda to see, to see his human bias here. Also, if NG isn't acting human enough, maybe let him act as a human gear character. I mean, surely that makes more sense anyway, given that you're trying to make the company and therefore human gear look better. To emphasise the point that humor gear very much reacts to and learn from humans, we get NG asking himself why he's such a failure. And that hurts. That hurts. See what you do to people. And then we get Horobi appearing like he's about to invite Enji to fight a bunch of Kamen Riders in exchange for a wish because his parents get him locked up in an attic for his entire childhood. I so wish they'd have interacted. Just a bit. Just one line. I think about Horobi and Enji a lot, but I'll talk about it more in the relevant episodes. Adoto then asks Oda once again to just believe in humor gear, and at this point in the series I felt like this was a perfectly okay sentiment, this fixation wasn't weird and disturbing back then. At this point, yeah, I can buy that Adoto does genuinely just care. In fact, it felt almost like character development. Because back at the manga episode, Adoto didn't seem to care about the humor gear, he just cared about the manga artist getting his passion back, but here he's actually properly really advocating for humor gear and that was nice. The line, after all, a humor gear won't save my life, hits me differently now than it did back then. With what I know now, and with how the series ended with absolutely no character growth whatsoever and barely any future hope for humor gear equality. Now that line gets to me more because it's more of the same of humor gear having to do something to prove their worth. But I wasn't that cynical back then, I didn't really have much of a reason to be. I didn't even think about it, it's really not worth thinking about. <laughs> but I suppose I wish a sentiment was more, a humor gear once saved my life so now it's my turn to save theirs. And then of course, poor NG is hacked. 
I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want to talk about it briefly. In early episodes, including this one, he's just said it, that's why I'm talking about it. Horobi doesn't so much as say Aka no Ishino Mamani, but Metsubojin no Ineto no Ishino Mamani. And it's things like that that make it so powerful that they keep the name Metsubojin at the end. And they have lines about what's really the will of Metsubojin Lai. It's like reclaiming the name and it's perfectly separating Metsubojin Lai from the arc. And oh, it just means a lot to me that they're still allowed to call themselves Metsubojin Lai after the series. It's just such a wonderful and easy yet impactful way to show how much the arc is projecting onto Metsubojin Lai and how Metsubojin Lai does not equal the arc. I also do just love calling Horobi <laughs> individually Metsubojin Lai and Fua individually Ames. I don't know why, it just makes me laugh. Like, yes, the Horobi is the whole of Metsubojin Lai, Fua is the whole of Ames. <laughs> I could talk for hours about the way Takayo Seiji fights as horribly- God, suit actors. <laughs> Actually, no, I will. As if this video won't end up being long enough. <laughs> Takayo Seiji is horribly, and Naota Yuya as Zero One complement each other perfectly, don't they? <laughs> Takayo has this slow, calculated way of moving as horribly. Well, he fights like Sinagawa moves as horribly. It's all with a purpose. Meanwhile, Naota kind of flails a bit after Horobi's attacks. Horobi is walking forward slowly, then Aruto strikes, Horobi pushes him back, continues walking slowly while Aruto while Aruto <laughs> while Aruto flails a bit and recovers to strike again. It's so perfectly done so that we can appreciate both. It takes Aruto long enough to recover so that we can really appreciate Horobi's movements, while it also highlights how inexperienced that this Aruto really is. I don't know if any of that made sense just then, <laughs> it's just so perfectly done. Edito's expressive movements highlight Horobi's control of his own movements and Horobi's control of movement highlights Edito's expressive movements and suit actors are amazing. I suppose it kind of goes back to what Oda Shinya was saying about acting, the two of them are just playing off each other perfectly, both of them complement each other and they both stand out because of it. None of what I just said were words, were they? <laughs> And after the fight, Aruto yells, NG, as if he cares about him specifically and not the fact that he's an actor and damn it, I was just getting through to Oda Shinya. That's not important to Aruto right now, what's important is NG. He's walking through the completely destroyed set and he finds Enji's burned script on the floor that he had in his hand and then dropped before becoming a Magia. And I have such a thing for going to the... A scene of an aftermath of a fight, seeing all the destruction, walking slowly through it, and just finding something that belonged to the person who died. <laughs> That's always so chilling to me. The scene is so physically painful, and I've only known NG for two episodes, an episode and a half. Aruto picks up the script and just stares at it, and Aruto is watching this happen, but Aruto doesn't even notice he's there. All he can focus on is this burnt script, and the purpose of this drama, of NG being in this drama, is to put humor gear in the company in a better light, but he doesn't care about that right now, he just cares about NG as a person who died. This whole seconds long scene is so painful and I would have been so much more sympathetic towards Aruto throughout the series if we had more moments like this of him actually caring and actually being affected by humor gear deaths because he is so torn up about this. Later on we get a scene opening up with a poster of Enji and Oda and Aruto is looking just broken up absolutely distraught and they are really going all out with this. NG is dead and that's sad. Be sad. And I actually love this scene. Fukuzore is primarily concerned about the company, what all these events mean for the company. The drama is halting production, Oda Shinya is resigning and NG has been destroyed. In that order, NG's death is on par with an actor resigning and a drama stopping filming. And as usual, Aruto doesn't say anything about this, but in this instance, he doesn't have to. That one inclusion that lasted just seconds of Aruto walking through the destroyed set and picking up that burned script, and then the next scene focusing in on the poster for a second or two, it makes Aruto's silence not annoying. Because right now, this isn't a person you'd expect to stand up for humor gear and actually do something. And this isn't someone with really disturbingly twisted priorities. <laughs> this is someone who has been visibly affected by someone's death 
So of course he isn't saying anything, what is there to say? Everything that could be said has already been said. Sure, the production is for the company, but it's more about humor gear. And while I have my issues with specifically focusing on the potential of humor gear and not just showing people, hey, humor gear are people, stop being dicks. Early on in this episode, I do think that Adito pushing the potential of humor gear is his own way of saying that. It's just, I think he should have learned throughout the series that it shouldn't be about what humor gear can do for you. I don't think there's much wrong from a character arc point of view with him having this stance now. I just think he maybe should have not had that stance by the end of the series. But forgetting that for a minute and just focusing on this one episode, then he's talked about essentially putting Hume Gear above the company. He tried to convince Orada to give Enji another chance. He yelled Enji's name when he died, and he focused specifically on Enji's burned script on the floor. So I think it's okay that he's staying silent now. His silence bothered me in a lot of episodes like the manga episode where he really should have been using his status as president of Hidan Intelligence to at least do something. But here, like, what is there to do? I think Adito staying silent in this moment says a lot more than if he'd have said something. Adito not speaking this time, at least to me, doesn't indicate that he doesn't care, it's the exact opposite. Oda Shinji comes in and he and Adito have a nice heart to heart where he talks about having faith in Enji and Adito tells him that Enji is long gone and Oda says that creating another doesn't sound so bad. And I personally think building a new Matsuda NG was handled really quite delicately. Really quite nicely. I honestly thought this was a wonderful way to do it. It didn't feel like they were saying, oh well it's fine he died because we could just make another. It wasn't flipping it wasn't flippant and uncaring. It was more that they were realising or or the Shinya was realising his mistakes with the previous NG and making sure he doesn't do it again. They can't make it up to the NG that died, but they can make sure this new NG is treated well. Because we can't go back and change the past. Oda can't undo his unwillingness to work with the previous NG, but he can work on bettering himself in the future. And I like that it was about NG, about putting faith in NG, about growth as a person. And Oda Shinya was about to resign, I have to stress this, I think that was a very important inclusion because it just stresses that this isn't about Oda's role in this drama. It isn't about the drama going ahead. This isn't viewing NG as just a tool to make filming a little bit easier. It's about making amends. It felt like just for a moment NG, a humor gear, was being considered a person, not just a helpful tool that needs replacing. Then Oda does indeed say, let's keep the, dra- let's keep the show going for the drama. But it's not about the drama. And he puts his hand on the poster. But his hand is specifically on Enji's shoulder. (laughs) He doesn't feel like Enji is being replaced. It feels like he's leaving behind his own legacy. Also, before I move on, I just want to say, I think this is a great way to show why you should absolutely ignore writing advice if it helps you. (laughs) One of the biggest rules is claiming that you shouldn't undo deaths. To the point where I see so many people automatically claiming that undoing certain deaths in certain films automatically undermines death when that's not true at all if it's done well like this kind of sort of technically bringing NG back doesn't erase what just happened and it doesn't make humor gear death any less real sure you could argue that if they're going to be using at least the same base code then technically they could be classed as the same person just having lost all of their memories and experiences bringing humor gear back is not undoing their deaths And I would argue in general that if you replace killing someone and bringing them back with this person just having a nap or popping off to the shops and the story would be completely different, clearly then you are not just bringing someone back and undoing the death. Kingsman 2 wouldn't have happened the way it did if Harry hadn't have died. This episode would not have carried on the way it did if Enji hadn't died. The death itself has had an impact. No matter whether or not you consider this Enji basically the same as the previous Enji, or if they're two completely different people, if Enji hadn't have died, the story would be different, and I think that's something a lot of writers should consider when they really want to do something clever or bring a dead character back but are scared of breaking the cardinal rule. Break the rules, it's fine. <laughs> so they start filming again and Oda sort of slips in into this mentor role for NG. Is that something we really stick with and watch play out? But you can see it in the background, Orada addresses NG a lot more. He actually talks to him like, right, shall we then? 
NG is studying his lines, looking like he's struggling with them. He seems very wide-eyed and surprised and not too sure of himself. So Arda goes and pats his back and the camera then cuts away, but I get the impression he's either going to talk him through it or he's going to reassure him or something, but the point is, he's seen NG, acknowledged that he's struggling a bit and gone to talk to him. <laughs> Compare this to Arda just getting frustrated that NG seems to have this imaginary problem and giving up on him. Now he's actually having a problem and Arda is helping him through it. Then Yua comes to take Arito to meet Guy and I feel like there's a lot more to pull apart in this scene than I'm capable of doing. Guy's in this very minimalist office, it's just a large empty room with his desk and chair and chest set. The room is surrounded by giant windows, all of which are covered in blinds as if he's expecting that I already did the Ryuki joke. <laughs> One day I'll make an entire video just bullshitting an analysis of this room. <laughs> then he does something with his fancy technological watch and the room completely changes. The windows are now further back and there's a door and you can see out into the garden. The desk is gone. The desk is gone and instead there are fancy red chairs and a fancy table. There are house plants. There's even a piano. The room is brighter and looks even larger. And of course he easily could have set this all up in advance. He knew Alito was coming. And this is clearly for show. No, he wanted Alito to see what he can do. Then he gives Alito a physical business card. Alito, on the other hand, gives Guy his business card digitally. There's something to be said here. <laughs> it's this huge technological spectacle. Everything looks extremely bloody fancy and then a physical business card on actual card. As for the room itself, of course it's of course, the brighter one with open curtains would be more inviting, whereas the darker one with concealed w windows would suggest there's more to hide. I don't really need to go into that. But there's just something about that business card that I can't stop thinking about. <laughs> anyway, Guy says he wants to buy hidden intelligence and we immediately cut to them filming the drama and the line is, this is a setup. <laughs> Not so clever. <laughs> okay, I know I very regularly sound sarcastic when I don't mean to be. Moments like those are really actually clever and I really like them. <laughs> also, this is also the moment in the drama where Giddy realises that somebody else is pulling the strings. Really wish this drama had been applied to a certain something else too. A drama about refusing to see both sides of the coin, questioning what you thought was true, and now there's someone else pulling the strings. <laughs> Awada being actually shot, by the way, is also just extremely clever. I mean, that is just so not everything is as it seems, isn't it? Of course it's revealed that Ansel's Chen actually shot Arada right at the same time the actor shoots him, which I find really interesting because Ansel's Chen is disguised and he even disguised the shot, but then he waits long enough for people to see him, he doesn't just put the gun away straight away, and then he reveals himself to be a humor gear. It was specifically important that a humor gear was seen to be shooting a human. It wasn't enough for Ansatz Chan to complete his learning, it had to be seen. Horobi does show up later to confirm this. A humor gear has now laid hands on a human, it's a statement. I also find it interesting that the final act Ansatz Chan has to do in his learning process is kill Awada Shinya. If the point was simply to display a human gear killing a human, then it could have been any human, but it wasn't. It was Oada Shinya, someone else that Chan looked up to. He even says, Shisho, after he shoots him. Kind of reminds me of the Kingsman, when, where they have to shoot the dog, except it's a blank and the dogs are fine, just to prove their loyalty. It's not enough to kill a random human. He's killing a human of a high status, first of all, someone in the public eye and someone who meant something to Ansas Chan. The other bit I find extremely interesting is the human director declaring that humor gear are indeed evil killing machines, while Enji, the humor gear, is in the background having the biggest reaction to this. Everyone else is just staring at Arito, but Enji is really freaking out like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, kind of reaction. Yeah, I can totally see how all humor gear are killing machines. <laughs> Oh god, Arito yelling said tiny unison, I I remember seeing the teaser for this and thinking, oh god, I bet Ansar's Chan's gonna gain singularity and go good and Horobi's gonna kill him and it's gonna be this huge unforgivable thing and he's never gonna get the redemption he deserves. Even back then I was waiting for Horobi to be rescued from the bloody arc. <laughs> I'd spend every episode paranoid that they're going to make Horobi do this one big unforgivable thing, despite clearly being a hacking victim, just to show no he's beyond saving. <laughs> 
Oh, I thought that's all I had to say. Um, a horror being and a little fight and sting scorpion protects horror being from an attack and I did a whole entire video just about being emotional about sting scorpion. It happened now, that's so cute! <laughs> Pinces and sting him around horror being protectively and then it dissipates. So sting scorpion, the embodiment of sting scorpion, formulated just to protect horror being and then disappeared again and ah. Oh. <laughs> Awada Shinya is undergoing its treatment and on the road to recovery. That's interesting. You'd think at this point, having completed his learning, Ansas Chan would be able to kill a person. You'd think he wouldn't leave room for his target to receive life saving medical treatment. That's interesting. Next episode has the introduction of Wazu the detective, and I don't really remember that well since it's not really one I tend to go back to. So I have no clue what I'm going to talk about next time, but there will be something. There's always something. <laughs> I could talk for hours about anything. <laughs>